Welcome everyone to Scheller Lunchtime Live, a live stream series hosted by the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business. My name is Lindsay Kane, and I'm the Associate Director of Client Relationships for non-degree executive education programs. On Select Fridays at 12 p.m. Eastern, you'll have the chance to hear from Scheller faculty, student, and alumni speakers as they discuss relevant topics for the tech-driven digital age. At Scheller, we're proud to offer undergraduate, MBA, and PhD programs, along with open enrollment and custom executive education programs. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniel Wakeley, Assistant Professor of Finance at Scheller. Daniel received his PhD from the University of Michigan and received a BSBA from the University of Missouri. He researches topics related to the interaction between financial markets and government agencies, the asset pricing and real effects of firm and financial intermediary financial constraints, and the investing ability of individuals and professional investors. He has published in the Journal of Finance, the Review of Financial Studies, and the Review of Asset Pricing Studies. He teaches investments at the graduate and undergraduate level at Scheller. Today, Daniel will discuss a range of economic influences causing today's financial upheavals, including rising prices and interest rates and slowing economic growth. He will also offer insights into how to weather the storm of financial uncertainty. As always, feel free to ask questions in the comments section. Daniel will address as many questions as possible at the end of his presentation. Over to you, Daniel. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, our current economic climate and hopefully give you guys some understanding of what is going on. So to outline my talk, I, I'm going to first give a broad overview of the current state of the U.S. economy and the global economy. I'll do a bit of a retrospective on uh, the inflation we've seen over the past couple of years and some of the drivers of that inflation. Uh, then I'll move to what the Federal Reserve is attempting to do. I'll discuss how a potential recession or further inflation or decline in inflation might affect as, uh, asset markets and financial markets. And then at the end, I've done a lot of uh, research on individual investors. I'll talk about whether or not I think uh, you all should be speculating on market movements. So to begin, I'm, I want to talk about uh, inflation. So this is a, a figure uh, of inflation over the past uh, 70 uh, plus years. And there's two uh, measures of inflation here. Uh, in red is core inflation and in blue is headline inflation. The difference between the two is that the blue will include food and energy prices uh, and then the core uh, excludes those because those are more volatile components uh, of our consumption basket. And to give you guys an idea of how the government actually measures inflation, they, they, they essentially track prices and price changes on goods and services throughout the economy, but they come up with a representative com consumption basket for a typical U.S. household, and they track how that consumption basket, the price of that consumption basket, uh, changes over time. And what we're seeing right now is a huge increase in prices. All of you all know that, uh, especially our headline inflation number is up to close to eight and a half uh, percentage points. Right now, core inflation is about six percentage points. Uh, for people under 40, this is the highest inflation we've seen uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, for people over 40, you might remember uh, inflation at this level and even higher uh, in the late uh, 70s, early 80s. Uh, the Fed to fight inflation, then uh, the Fed chairman, Paul Volcker, raised interest rates dramatically. People that were buying houses back in that time period were paying interest rates of like 17 percentage points on their mortgage. So much higher interest rates than we're currently seeing uh, right now. So the question right now is what is driving uh, this inflation? And there's been a number of drivers of uh, inflation, or at least uh, that have been proposed by, by economists and, and firms. One is that when the pandemic hit, it completely disrupted supply chains. Uh, <clears throat> We couldn't produce things because there was a pandemic going on. Uh, people were getting sick. Uh, China has a zero COVID policy. The U.S. government uh, instituted lockdowns and, and uh, mandates on economic activity. It just slowed down production of a lot of goods uh, and services. This figure here is a plot of online retailers' stockouts or products that are sold out over time. It's the percentage of products sold out over time. 
and this comes from a paper by Cavallo and Kristoff, they find that in 2019, about 10 to 15% of products are, are sold out at any point in time. When the pandemic hits, it's up to 45% of products are sold out. And that number has come down. But even in 2021, we were seeing stockouts of you know, over 35% uh, at some points in time in 2021. So there were there was just a lot less supply of the parts and finished goods that firms needed. And a lot of firms responded to this lack of supply by over-ordering, by trying to build up their inventories. And so this increased demand. We already had low supply. This can help push up prices. Ongoing, I think there are uh, firms that are rethinking their supply chains. They are considering the risk of these stockouts and parts not showing up when they need, need them. So there's discussions of firms building up inventory and moving somewhat away from just-in-time supply chains. There are other firms that are diversifying their supply chain uh, out of certain countries or away from certain countries. For instance, the zero COVID policy uh, in China has disrupted uh, supply chains for firms. And so a lot of them or some of them might be considering moving to other countries or near sourcing, moving production to Mexico, et cetera. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, other potential drivers of inflation is that demand for goods and services has shifted dramatically uh, throughout the COVID uh, period. So this is a plot of changes in U.S. consumer spending by sector uh, during the first few months of the pandemic. You guys all are well aware of this. Everybody went out and bought groceries, uh, still bought groceries when we were stuck at home. Nobody was traveling. We were spending less on healthcare, restaurants. We weren't going out. We weren't buying much apparel. So there's this huge shift in demand during COVID. And then as vaccines rolled out, we kind of got back to normal. We've seen shift in demand in the other way. There's just been this whiplash, which can throw off firm forecasting for demand and uh, disrupt the supply and demand balance, uh, which can lead to uh, variation in prices and, and, and inflation. Related to this, there's been a shift in where people want to live. So we have, we've had this broad shift towards remote work, hybrid remote work or full-time remote work, especially in white collar jobs, which has allowed workers to live further uh, from their employer. So there's been an exodus of people from city centers out to suburbs. And for people that can work remotely full-time, they can live anywhere. Uh, and so I have a paper looking at interstate migration by higher income individuals, mainly individuals making over $100,000 per year. These individuals started moving to places like Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, Texas, uh, to the south here. And one thing that's interesting, some work by uh, Redfin shows that areas or cities where more people move to during COVID, they're also experiencing higher inflation. So Atlanta, a lot of people move to Atlanta during COVID. We also have some of the highest inflation of the major metropolitan areas. Places like San Francisco and New York, where uh, people have sort of relatively been moving out of uh, relatively low uh, inflation rates. Another potential driver of inflation uh, is the fiscal policy that a lot of countries implemented uh, in the wake of COVID to help alleviate the hardship from lockdowns and the lack of economic activity. So the government provided us a lot of money through uh, PPP loans and other generous unemployment uh, insurance. And this helped buoy demand at a time when supply was down. And the US was especially generous. This is a, a figure that has the deviation from projected spending uh, by for a government, some of the major governments in the world. You see that the US deviation is about 20% uh, higher spending than projected without, uh, if there wasn't COVID. Canada, around 20%, UK, around 17% here. And some analysis by uh, people that work at the Fed, uh, they comes up with an estimate of the U.S. domestic domestic stimulus directly leading to about two and a half percentage points higher excess inflation in the U.S. Another driver, more recent, is the invasion of Ukraine and the related sanctions. It's led to higher food prices, higher energy prices, uh, is disrupted fertilizer markets to some degree. Here's the global food price index uh, from 2019 through 2022. We see with the invasion of Ukraine, 
Food prices shot up, although they've come down some recently. Gasoline prices did a similar uh, up and down. One major impact of uh, the invasion of Ukraine has been in the natural gas market in Europe. So a lot of European countries get their natural gas or a large portion of their natural gas from Russia. And we know Russia recently turned off the Nord Stream uh, 1 pipeline. Because they're not getting as much natural gas from Russia, the price of natural gas in Europe has gone up dramatically. So in early 2022, natural gas cost about a less than 100 euros per megawatt hour. And it shot up with the invasion. And then in the summer, as firms have started, or countries have started stockpiling their natural gas, getting ready, ready for the winter to use natural gas to heat homes, the, this has boosted demand for natural gas in European countries. And the price of natural gas has gone up about threefold since then. Consumers in Europe haven't really bared this cost yet. They will in, in the winter months. A lot of governments in Europe are trying to figure out how uh, they can deal with this huge burden uh, on their households. Another uh, potential driver of inflation is that workers seem to have more bargaining power now than, than pre-COVID. There's a number of potential reasons for this. In certain sectors, there's been a lot of COVID burnout Nursing, for instance, it seems like there's been a lot of quits in nursing and hospitals struggling to find nurses. Travel nurses are making a great living uh, right now, moving around to hospitals that need help. Uh, for a while, there was a generous government support for the unemployed, which maybe allowed people to look for work longer and look for better jobs, gives them more bargaining power. There, is, there are some arguments to be made that people have reevaluated what they're looking for in a job, what they're looking for in an employer, and they're not settling as much. And then some very recent analysis uh, argues that long COVID is keeping about two to four million people out of the workforce. I would take that number with a grain of salt, uh, but there is potentially some impact on uh, the number of employable workers out there because of uh, long COVID. Some examples of how this worker bargaining power is playing out uh, is one, it, in especially tw like the summer of 2021, it seemed really hard for uh, restaurants to hire employees. If you went to try to buy a sandwich uh, in June, 2021, it took forever to get your sandwich because they didn't have enough workers there. I actually uh, have a paper on this where we use cell phone data to look and see how long it was taking people to get in and out of restaurants. And we saw a spike up in 2021 in, in terms of abnormal wait times uh, for people to get their food. Uh, another example is that investment banking interns in 2021 made a PowerPoint deck complaining about how hard uh, their lives are. And investment banks responded. I think in prior years, they might not have responded, but because the labor market's so tight, they need this talent. Uh, the, the banks responded and, and companies like Goldman Sachs ended up boosting their starting salaries for interns from $85,000 to $110,000. And in a more broad example of how tight the labor market is and how much like bargaining power workers have, uh, currently there are two job postings or two job vacancies for every unemployed individual uh, in the economy. So the job market is really hot right now. There are low jobless claims and it's really pushing up nominal wages. So this is nominal wage growth over time. This is provided by the Atlanta Fed. You see in 2021, 2022, nominal wages are growing dramatically. That's just like the wage on your paycheck. Now, your purchasing power is not growing as much because inflation is eroding our purchasing power, but nominal wages are, are, are skyrocketing. So the job market is hot. We're going to talk about what like, the Fed's probably is, is trying to cool that down. Uh, it does seem like there's already some cracks, though. A, lot, a number of companies have come out to say they're planning to shrink their workforce, Ford, Walmart, Robinhood, Redfin. And like I said, real wages uh, are falling. So there's a lot of factors contributing to inflation. There's a few more that I didn't, I don't have slides on. There's climate and weather shocks that can affect uh, the supply of uh, different crops. And then there's an argument to be made that the Fed was too accommodative, too accommodative and too slow to respond to the inflation in 2021. And that helped feed the inflation that we're seeing uh, today. <clears throat> so we have high inflation right now. We have a very hot uh, job market. We have lots of vacancies per unemployed individual out there. We have seen economic growth slowing over the past two quarters. It's basically zero. It just depends on how you measure it. And the U.S. economy is not alone. There 
most major developed economies are facing similar or worse issues, especially in Europe. And we might see some social or political unrest uh, as these things play out. So what is the Fed doing in this economy? Well, right now they are hiking interest rates and they're being very hawkish on inflation. They're saying, we're going to keep raising interest rates until we get inflation down towards our goal of 2%, the core inflation of 2%. So by raising inflation, uh, raising interest rates, the Fed is going to worsen financial conditions, typically lowers valuations on uh, financial assets. Firms and consumers are going to borrow and spend less because they'd have to pay higher interest rates to do so. And firms should be less willing to hire and invest as well. So this should help cool off the labor market. So this is a cost of getting inflation down is uh, we have a, a cooler labor market for uh, graduates and everyone looking for a job. So there is a major debate going on among uh, economists and investors about, are we going to have to experience a serious recession, unemployment over five percentage points for the Fed to get inflation back to their target? Or can the Fed somehow pull off a soft landing? The Fed seems to be signaling that, th that they think they can pull off a soft landing where Unemployment won't increase very much. Maybe these job postings will decrease, uh, but we won't have a lot of people losing their jobs. There's a third camp that says maybe there's going to be some middle ground on inflation and unemployment where the Fed says we can't get inflation down to two percentage points, but we don't want to raise interest rates anymore. And so we'll have somewhat high inflation and somewhat higher uh, unemployment. And there's smart people on all sides of these arguments. So what does this mean for asset returns if the Fed is being hawkish on inflation and they're going to raise interest rates? Well, typically when the Fed raises interest rates, the stock market doesn't like this. When Jerome Powell recently came out and said, we uh, are going to be tough on inflation, we're going to keep raising interest rates during his talk at, uh, at Jackson Hole, the stock market declined about three percentage points. Why does the stock market decline? Why do we see these negative returns when the Fed signals they're going to raise interest rates? Well, there's a few reasons. One, it increases the chance we'll be in a recession and firms are going to have lower profits and lower cash flows. So the cash flows we're getting from holding the stock are going to be lower. We should pay less for it. The price is going to fall. Similarly, if we're if interest rates are increasing, we're going to be discounting those future cash flows more, which will lead to lower valuations as well. So if you're an investor, a lot of investors, I think, are trying to figure out what they should do with their money. And I'll talk later. I don't think you should try speculating for the most part. But if you want to speculate, if you think that the Fed's going to put us in a relatively uh, deep recession, a deeper recession than the marginal investor currently thinks, well, you might want to get out of the market and, or tilt your portfolio towards uh, treasury bonds, cash, put put your money in a checking account. One safe asset you can put your money in that has high returns right now are these uh, high bonds, which are inflation uh, index bonds that are currently paying about 9.62% uh, in interest, uh, which a lot of finance professors I talk to think that's probably the best deal out there right now. Uh, if you want to stay in stocks, you might want to tilt towards lower beta stocks. Beta is a measure of how much the stock's returns go, goes up and down with the market. A lower beta stock, its returns is going to be less sensitive to the overall market. How about crypto? Crypto has been pitched in the past as being a safe haven uh, for, for uh, your money. It's uncorrelated with the broader financial market. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Uh, Bitcoin has a correlation with the U.S. stock market of over 50% right now. So uh, as the stock market goes, so does uh, crypto, it seems. How about gold? Gold, maybe. I, I looked at the correlation between a return on a gold ETF and the stock and the S&P 500 over the past year. It's about a, a zero correlation with the market. So it's probably a better safe haven than crypto. If you're just trying to uh, put your money somewhere that it's not going to be affected by uh, a potential downslide in the stock market. What if you want to speculate on inflation? So one thing I want to uh, cement in your guys' heads is that 
the current levels of inflation, this eight and a half percent inflation, it's already priced it into asset returns. Everybody knows about this. All these smart investors know the impact or have a good idea of the impact of this high inflation. Uh, now, if you want to speculate, you should think about whether or not your expectations of inflation is different from the marginal investor right now. So if you think inflation is going to be uh, surprisingly high, well, uh, asset classes that do well when inflation is surprisingly high are commodities. You could buy a commodity uh, index ETF. Uh, you could uh, invest in a break-even strategy, which is essentially buying uh, a treasury inflation protected security that'll uh, change in value when inflation uh, goes up. You, What you shouldn't do if you think inflation is going to be higher than expected is invest in equities. Equities perform poorly when inflation is surprisingly high. Treasuries also uh, do poorly when inflation is surprisingly uh, high. On the other hand, if you think the Fed is going to get inflation down uh, quick or that we're going to see some of these supply factors that are uh, affecting inflation uh, dissipate and inflation to be surprisingly low, then equities do fairly well when inflation is surprisingly low. Treasuries do really well uh, when inflation is surprisingly low. I grabbed this figure from a paper uh, by some people at AQR, which is an investment firm. And they have they came up with a couple of strategies, a macro momentum strategy and a trend chasing strategy that actually they do well both when inflation is surprisingly high or surprisingly low. I don't have time to talk about these in detail, but if you're interested, you can go read uh, that paper. Uh, depending, uh, if you want to stay in the stock market, uh, different sectors are more or less correlated with inflation. Energy is highly correlated with inflation surprises. Consumer staples, consumer discretionary, uh, negatively correlated with inflation. And even within commodities, some commodities are more correlated with inflation than others. So energy is highly correlated, livestock, uh, not so much. Now, should you speculate? Should you be trying to figure out what's gonna happen with the market, be moving your money around? My suggestion is no, probably not. I have a, a paper where I looked at uh, individual investor trades over a number of years. Most individual investors have no idea what's gonna happen in the market. At least their trades don't indicate any sort of timing skill. The median individual investor has basically a zero correlation between their flows into and out of the market and market returns. On top of that, a lot of individual investors think they know what's going to happen. A lot of them are overconfident in their ability uh, to predict stock movements and market movements. Uh, there's a famous paper uh, written by Barber and Odin that showed that uh, men seem especially overconfident in their ability. Men trade about 45% more than women. And by trading so much, it's affecting their net returns. So men's net returns are about 2.65 percentage points lower per year because of all the trading they're doing and the trading costs they're paying. Women also are doing worse because they're trading so much, uh, about 1.72 percentage points. Now, when they wrote this paper, there were higher trading costs than today. But even though places like Robinhood, you don't pay a direct trading cost, there are trading costs in, in terms of the bid-ask spread. What I mean by that is the price that you will buy a stock at is higher than the price you can sell it at. So if you buy and then sell, you're going to lose money. So there are these transaction costs that might not be obvious at, at first glance. So you need to be aware uh, of that. Now, what should you do? Well, my suggestion is focus on risk mitigation at this point. There's a lot of uncertainty. And one great way to uh, decrease your, your overall risk of your wealth is to invest in a diversified portfolio. One example I like to give is that more than half of U.S. listed stocks since 1926 have delivered negative lifetime returns. And the 4% of the best performing uh, stocks since 1926 explain all of the net wealth generated by the U.S. stock market. The other 96%, you put them in a portfolio, it's going to earn you the treasury bill rate. So if you're out there trying to pick just a few stocks to invest in, most likely they're not going to be in that top 4% and you're not going to do very well. So spread your wealth across a number of assets in a number of asset classes. Now, I teach about optimal portfolio optimization uh, in my class, and there are very sophisticated ways to optimize your portfolio. 
But a simple strategy where you equally weight your investments across asset classes seems to do pretty well. So if you're if you're like uh, uh, uncertain about what to do and it's overwhelming, just equally weight across a number of asset classes uh, and across a number of countries as well. The other thing that you should do uh, is build up an emergency fund if you haven't already. Uh, at least three months of uh, living expenses and cash. Some financial advisors are currently saying two years of living expenses. What would you do if you lost your job right now? Could you handle that? If we do enter a recession, job market's not pretty, could you withstand a shock uh, to, your, to your income? So to conclude, uh, seems likely we'll face some sort of an economic contraction as the Fed fights inflation and due to these other headwinds in the global economy, uh, there's a non-trivial chance we'll enter a more severe recession and or experience persistent inflation. I, my personal finance advice is to focus more on risk mitigation instead of trying to speculate on which asset or asset class is going to perform uh, the best. And that is it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. There's some great chatter going on here, so we'll jump in. Um, so we're seeing a very polite confrontation between Chairman Powell's reserve policy and Secretary Janet Yellen's softer, not go back on current achievements approach to address macroeconomic policy, um, in particular before the upcoming midterm elections. Who will prevail at this point in time? Uh, that I, I don't know. I think that... Um, I think that uh, Chairman Powell uh, right now has, I guess, the most power. He and he's got a single focus. It seems like at this point in getting inflation uh, down. I can I can see why politically uh, Janet Yellen uh, does not approve of that. Uh, hopefully, the Fed is uh, just going to focus on their mandate of maximum employment and price stability and do what's best for the economy and not let politics uh, get involved. Um, yeah, we'll see. Excellent. Um, so what's the current fear level that will have another 2008 level housing market crash? Um, I've seen a lot of panic about that since the Fed raised interest rates. Are these fears justified in your opinion? Uh, that is a very good question. I don't want to speculate too much. I, I know a lot of the places that saw the, like a, a ton of in-migration during COVID, places like Boise, Idaho, but also saw a huge run up in house prices. They're starting to see um, they're, they're the first to fall, it seems like, in terms of uh, lower housing activity and, and potentially lower prices as well. I, I, really, I really don't know. But with interest rates so high, a lot of people can't afford to buy a reasonable house uh, at the current valuations. So we'll see uh, if, if prices adjust. That's a good question. Especially in Atlanta, it seems. Uh, yeah. By the efficient market hypothesis, when we assume the decrease in cash flows and lower revenues are priced into stocks? Yes. So um, that that is, that is true, that whatever the current interest rate path uh, it should be priced in to cash flows and uh, uh, revenues, or that should be priced into stocks. Now, what what happens is if the Fed comes out and su is surprisingly hawkish and says we're going to raise interest rates more, or we're going to be even tougher on infl inflation than people currently thought, there's some news or some surprise factor there. Then we see stock prices adjust. So stock prices, you're right, should only adjust to new information we get about the future interest rate path or future uh, Fed policy. Fed policy. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Um, are we indeed at or past peak inflation? Examples, energy that they get. Um, I, I hate to. I hope so. Uh, it seems like, at least the the most recent reading, we were we're trending in the right uh, direction for headline inflation. Core inflation is still going up. So. I don't know. We might have a few more months of higher core inflation, but hopefully the Fed can turn things around quickly. But I'm not very I'm not super confident in either direction on that. 
All right. Well, thank you. Um, our next Shiller Lunchtime Live is Friday, October 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern featuring Dr. Katie Badura. Katie will discuss where a sense of impunity comes from, the implications it has for the workplace, and how you can best avoid its pitfalls as an employee and manager. You can register for this event and learn more about future Shiller Lunchtime Live sessions by following the Georgia Tech Shiller College of Business on LinkedIn. A recording of this session and future sessions will be available on our LinkedIn and YouTube pages as well. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay.